Chapter 5 Kelly was soft. Wren had been all angles, always far too thin, wave-like. Kelly was short, but she was also soft against him, and Dylan found himself liking it. She was pressed up against him, one leg threaded through his, her nose buried in his throat. He could feel little puffs of air as she slept. One of her hands had crept underneath his shirt and was on his bare back. He knew she was going to be embarrassed when she woke to find that she'd been feeling him up in her sleep. Kelly was a cuddler. He found that he liked that, too. Dylan forced himself to just stay still and hold her. In the years since his wife's death, he hadn't been with anyone, hadn't wanted to be with anyone. He had been focused on just surviving, surviving the aftermath of Wren, surviving through Shannon's illness, surviving to take care of his boys after Shannon's death. He didn't want to just survive any more. Dylan wanted to live, like this group was enjoying life this weekend. He wanted Kelly, which was silly because he barely knew her. Kelly stirred. She yawned and stretched, arching her body. Her hand caught in his shirt as she pressed herself firmly and accidentally against him. Kelly paused as she comprehended she wasn't alone and cracked open an eye. Morning, Dylan said, his voice gravelly from sleep, or so he told himself. Kelly flushed a deep red, jerking herself and her hand away from him. It was caught in his tee and she pulled. In the process, she lifted her leg reflexively, the one that was threaded between his. Her knee connected hard. Dylan stiffened, closed his eyes, and drew in a sharp breath. He prayed not to throw up from the pain. Oh my, did I just... Kelly's voice came out in a squeak. Fortunately, she had stopped moving. He realized he had her upper arms clenched in his hands. Dylan slowly loosened his hold, hoping he hadn't bruised her. I'm sorry, she apologized, her hands moving, and he grabbed her arms again. "'Stop moving,' he hissed. "'Please.' "'Sorry,' Kelly whispered as she went absolutely still. Dylan concentrated on breathing. This certainly got rid of any romantic thoughts. His mind laughed at itself. He waited a few moments, then slowly took a deeper breath, realizing the pain had lessened. He opened his eyes to see a concerned and mortified Kelly watching him. "'I am so sorry,' she repeated. "'I didn't mean to.' I know. He cleared his throat and slowly let go of her arms. I'm going to be a few minutes. Why don't you go out for breakfast? Okay. Kelly bit her lip. Are you sure you want me to move? Maybe you should move first. He was sort of sprawled on her. Dylan closed his eyes and leaned his forehead against hers. He wasn't looking forward to moving for two distinct and separate reasons. First was pain, which would surely happen. Second was the sensation of having her under him, soft and welcoming. He needed to move before his body cut up to what his mind was thinking. Dylan tensed and rolled onto his back, pulling up his legs for comfort and putting his hands over his face as he exhaled. What a morning. I am going to get us some breakfast. Kelly scrambled to her knees and grabbed her shoes. Coffee, he managed to croak. Just coffee. Okay. She stumbled out of the tent, and he was mercifully alone. Kelly stumbled out of the tent and slipped on her shoes. She pushed her hair out of her face and practically raced into the woods. She couldn't believe that she had need him. Kelly did her morning business, then found the stream for a quick wash of her face and hands. Don't go that way, Bo warned her as he grabbed some water in the coffee pot. Bex and Tomlin... Kelly didn't even need to ask. It happened every camping trip. The only surprise was who would accidentally walk up on the couple. I don't know how they do this, Bo said thoughtfully as the two of them walked back toward the camp, giving the couple a wide berth. He's gone the rest of the year. Not even Bex knows where he goes or what he does. Yet every year she just welcomes him back, and they start up again for all of three or four days. Kelly shrugged. They have a unique relationship. I know I couldn't do it. How are things going between you and Mr. Needs to get laid? Bo asked. Kelly had an involuntary snorting laugh. I don't think he's going to be wanting to get laid any time soon. 
I accidentally groined him this morning in the tent. Ouch, Bo winced. Poor guy. Yup, Kelly said glumly. Hey, are you okay? Bo wrapped an arm around her. You seem a little off. Things are a little tough right now, Kelly shrugged. I'm probably worried over nothing. That's right. Don't worry over what you don't know. Bo said, Rule five. Rule six, leprechauns and unicorns are real. Kelly smiled at their silly childhood rules that the group had made years ago. Rule seven, no one is alone as long as they have a friend, Bo chimed happily. Rule eight, smiles are a warrior's weapon. They confuse the enemy. Kelly grinned. She loved her friends. Rule nine, Tomlin can get rid of the monsters under the bed, Bo said confidently. He has the magic touch, Kelly concurred. Thanks, Bo. No problem. He gave her a pat on the back. Shall we make breakfast for the slug beds and the two lovers? Please. Kelly was suddenly ravenous. Coffee first, though. Absolutely. Bo nodded. We can all use a caffeine boost before we hit the wall. It didn't take long for everyone to gather near the fire after the first smells of breakfast wafted from camp. Even Dylan came out, but waved away food sticking to coffee only. Bo raised an eyebrow and Kelly winced. Camp was disassembled and three hours later they were looking at what was affectionately known as the wall. The wall was exactly what it sounded like. A steep cliff area that rose forty or so feet from the end of the trail. The trail picked up again at the top of the wall. To get there, there used to be an anchored rope hanging down the cliff used for tying off and climbing. The rope is gone, Bo said unnecessarily. They all stared at the wall and the drop-off on the other side of the path. There were only three routes, up, down, or back along the trail. Someone took it off. Maybe it was in response to the liability, Dylan said dryly as he looked at the wall. It was a near vertical climb. If anyone got hurt here and the park knowingly left out climbing equipment, they could be held responsible in a lawsuit. Hey, don't be a downer, Mr. Insurance. Tomlin pulled the nylon rope out of his backpack. We just need to figure out a way for one of us to get up there and secure this rope. Then we're back in business. Dylan supposed Mr. Insurance was better than Mr. Needs to get laid. He eyed the wall. Give me the rope. Excuse me? Kelly looked at him in surprise. Bro, that is a straight climb without proper equipment, Bo said. I wouldn't do it. Listen to the firefighter, Tomlin scoffed. Can't be that hard. Listen to the firefighter, Derek stated more seriously. He mightn't just know what he's talking about. Ever free climbed? Dylan asked Tomlin. There's always a first time for everything, Tomlin said with a grin. Not at this height, Dylan cautioned. You should start smaller. What should we do? Just give up and go back down the trail? We've never not done the wall, Tiana said. Even pregnant Kelly and I did the wall. With safety harnesses, Bo shook his head. Never without. Is this part of the tradition? Dylan asked. Absolutely, Tomlin nodded. We go up here, follow the trail, and by the afternoon we raft down the river to the next camp. Dylan knelt and unlaced his boots. Pass me the rope. Are you sure about this? Tomlin asked. I got this. Dylan pulled the laces out of the boots through a belt loop and tied them. He stuffed the rope in one of the boots. I used to do this until a friend fell off a cliff. How bad was it? Bo asked. Eight broken bones? Dylan studied the wall and chose a starting point. You don't need to, Dylan. We can go back down the way we came. Kelly looked at the height and felt a fission of fear for Dylan. It's not a big deal. It's tradition, Kelly. Beck said. It is a big deal. I'm not going home till I've scaled the wall. Dylan ignored the remarks they made as they discussed the pros and cons of turning back. Beginning the ascent, he felt for hand and toe holds. Most climbers had special shoes on, but he found he did better without. It had been a long time, since before his marriage, that he'd gone climbing. As he began the familiar pattern, Dylan realized that he missed it. He had stopped because he had decided to be responsible and take less risks. Even now, if he fell and died, who would take care of Caden and Avery? One of his brothers would step in, but did he really want workaholics Jake and Everett taking care of his sons? Dylan grimaced, like he was any better. 
While he did pick up the boys from school every day and made certain to have supper with them, he had a tendency to bring home work with him. His home office saw as many hours as his work office at the company. It wasn't something he was proud of. Work had been an escape from the sorrows of his life. Dylan's foot slipped. For a moment he just held on desperately with the other three points of contact. Then Dylan took a deep breath and continued the climb. Perhaps he was showing off a little to Kelly's friends. He wasn't young any more. He was also out of practice and could feel the ache starting in his shoulders and neck. Free climbing forty feet was probably a stupid move. Fortunately, it wasn't all that much further to the top. Dylan stopped a moment to study his next moves. It was easier to the left, but going over the edge would present a problem. To the right was more difficult, but there was a tree that looked like it would easily hold his weight for getting to the top. It would also be a good tie-off for the rope that would help the rest of them ascend the wall. Dylan chose to go right. Carefully choosing his handholds and placing his feet in the nooks of the rock, he continued a steady climb. Making it to the tree, Dylan grabbed a root and tugged hard. It didn't even budge. Dylan used it to pull himself up over the edge of the wall and rolled onto the grass at the top. His hands and feet were burning from the exertion. He was a little sweaty despite the crisp fall air. Dylan hadn't felt this alive in years. The ground was solid beneath him. The sky was beautiful blue above him. The air was clear with the rustling of the leaves in the trees. He breathed it all in and felt good. Hey, you alive up there? Tomlin shouted. Give him a minute. He probably needs to recover, Bo said. It's not like he's young anymore. Ouch, Dylan winced. He wasn't that much older than the group. Dylan sat up and pulled the rope out of his boot. He tied it off around the tree, then threw the rest down. Tomlin grinned up at him. Dylan felt a sense of satisfaction at his accomplishment. Yes, he had been stupidly showing off old skills, but he felt good at having achieved the wall. He rolled his shoulders to get out the eggs, cleaned off his socks as best as he could, and put the hiking boots back on. He watched as they hooked Kelly up in a harness and attached her ratchet system to the rope. It was obvious that they had done it many times before, and Dylan was glad to see them go through the standard safety checks to ensure Kelly would be okay. Soon she was making her way to the top of the wall. Dylan helped her for the last piece, pulling her over the edge and close to him. Kelly ignored the butterflies in her stomach as Dylan helped unhook her from the harness. She blamed her breathlessness on the scent. There was a glint in Dylan's eyes, and she thought he looked self-satisfied and very male. There was a new confidence about him, as though he'd forgotten that he could make such climbs. Suddenly, Kelly thought this trip might be good for him in a way that he didn't expect. Dylan lowered the harness, and they watched Bex as she got harnessed next. "'You've climbed before,' Kelly stated unnecessarily. "'Have you gone rafting?' Dylan gave her a smile, and the butterfly swarmed in her abdomen. She realized he was looking forward to the rafting down the river. "'It's been a while.' Kelly smiled happily in return. She liked that he was enjoying himself. "'It's not a fast or big river, but we thought it was when we started camping.' It must be nice to have this tradition each year, he remarked. Kelly shrugged as she grinned. We're like a dysfunctional family. I love them to pieces. They helped Bex over the edge. Bex wrapped them both in a hug. Hello, lovebirds. What a rush. Kelly rolled her eyes and avoided looking at Dylan. She knew she was blushing. Let's get you out of the harness so the next person can come up, Dylan said practically. Bex giggled and helped. Soon enough, everyone had made it up, and the group good-naturedly argued about whether to leave the rope or to take it with them. Finally, they conceded to Dylan's calm statement that they would feel guilty if some kid got hurt by trying to climb it and remove the rope. Two hours later, they were taking turns pumping up the inflatable raft and stuffing their gear into waterproof bags. They loaded up the raft and pulled it into the river, everyone piling in. Kelly always loved this part of the journey. The girls held on, enjoying the ride, while the guys got to steer as best as they could with the oars. There were only a few rapids on this river, none of them even remotely dangerous. When they had been teenagers and just learning how to raft down the river, the rapids had seemed like a huge obstacle to surmount. Now it was easy, even if it was only an annual event. Bex, Tiana, and Kelly sat in the middle of the raft. With a quick series of hand signals, they decided who was going to get dunked this year. 
Kelly vetoed Dylan as a choice, so they decided to gang up on Bo since he hadn't been dunked in a couple of years. Don't even think about it, Derek said dryly. I'm not getting wet two years in a row. What? Bex blinked innocently. It's tradition. Tiana shrugged. We weren't going to get you anyways. However, now that you've mentioned it, if I go in, your boy Dylan goes in with me. Derek grabbed Dylan's collar. Dylan stiffened in surprise. What is going on here? Maybe all of them should get wet this year. Kelly looked at the girls. They made quick signals of agreement. Nah, that would be too mean. Besides, girls aren't allowed to row the raft. Bo keeps telling us that it's a manly job. I never said any such thing. Bo was interrupted as the girls split, each going for their preselected guy. Bex grabbed Tomlin's leg, shoving him up and over into the water. Tiana overcompensated and accidentally went over with Bo into the river, the oar flailing in the air. Kelly used her shoulder to check Derek hockey style. He was already leaning out too far, trying to avoid her. It didn't take a moment for him to slip slowly from the inflated boat, still holding onto Dylan's collar, dragging him backward. She laughed as Dylan grabbed at anything to keep himself upright. Kelly stopped laughing when he tossed his oar into the boat and grabbed her. Kelly squealed as he pulled her into the icy waters with them. Dylan's voice was in her ear as they surfaced. Are you okay? I'm fine, Kelly's teeth chattered. It was cold. Hey, guys, Bex called to them as she slowly floated away. How do you steer this thing with only one person? She is kidding, right? Dylan asked. With Bex, one never really knows. Derek replied, slogging his way through the water after the raft. How is it that someone as tiny as you was able to get Derek out of the raft? Dylan questioned. Low center of gravity, Kelly said. Also, he wasn't sitting very securely. Bex, swing it towards the shore! Tomlin shouted as he floated on the surface of the water past them. I vote we go to land. Dylan had his hands on her shoulders. Standing up, the water rushed around Kelly's waist. He stood behind her to make sure that the current wasn't buffeting her too hard. Kelly tried to ignore the fact that he was standing so close. Or that Tiana winked as she and Bo waded through the water. Or that he smelled amazing, even after hiking and getting dunked in the river. Are you sure we shouldn't be helping Bex and Tomlin? I think he's got it. Bo put a hand over his eyes to shade them from the sun as he watched Bex and Tomlin deal with the raft. We can get out here and walk over. There's a game trail beside the river. They all made their way to the rocks near the riverbank. Dylan offered Kelly a hand to help her up. Kelly ignored Tiana's suggestive look as she accepted Dylan's hand. He was just being a gentleman, she was certain. Kelly ignored the little thrill that coursed through her at the simple contact. She let go of his hand as soon as it was polite to do so. Kelly was trying to ignore a lot of things about Dylan Ramsley. Like how handsome he was without his glasses. He really ought to think about getting contacts. On second thought, maybe not. The last thing Kelly wanted was for other single moms like Susan Heiths to start flocking around him. The group got together at the raft where Tomlin was tying it off to prevent it from escaping. They all grabbed dry clothes and headed off in two groups to get changed. I change my mind, Tiana said. I can see why you think he's hot. Kelly looked up to the sky. Help me. Bex laughed. He is in shape. He looks fine in regular clothes, although the suit was nice, I guess. Didn't she say he had something about the eyes and voice? That I don't get. Oh, those aren't bad, Tiana said. It helps the glasses are gone. He can't read without them, Kelly said. He should get the laser eye surgery, Tiana recommended. He's rich enough to afford it. Back to what I was driving at. You like that he's a total gentleman. He's the type to treat a lady right. Bex frowned. That's nice, but what about sexy time? No one wants a gentleman in bed all the time. Can we just get changed? Kelly asked. I think Kelly can get him all hot and bothered, Tiana was confident. He gravitates to her every time she's near. I think he thinks she's cute. La, 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 Kelly plugged her ears. I'm not listening. 
How are you going to get dressed while you're plugging your ears? Tiana asked. Kelly rolled her eyes and grabbed a dry pair of jeans. Mister needs to get laid, likes Kelly, Vex sang loudly. Stop it, Kelly hissed. The guys aren't that far away. Able to pee stray yet? Bo asked Dylan. Dylan paused in surprise as he put on a shirt. She told you. Nothing much is kept secret here. Bo grinned. She was pretty embarrassed. I think we both were, Dylan replied dryly. Be glad she only told me. This is the extent of my ribbing. Bo laughed. The others would tease you mercilessly all day. How long has everyone known each other? Dylan questioned curiously. Tiana and Kelly have known each other since first grade. Tomlin and I knew each other in high school. The rest of us met up at this camp for disadvantaged kids which was held in this park, Bo explained. It's where us city kids got a love for the woods. And you've all stayed friends. Dylan was surprised. Most of his friends from school and afterward had slowly gone their separate ways. He supposed he hadn't helped matters by withdrawing after Ren's death and during Shannon's illness. That's pretty amazing. Do they still have the camp? They closed it for lack of funding. Bo shrugged. It's a shame. That is. Dylan wondered how long it had been shut down. The guys bagged their wet clothes and made their way to the raft. They didn't have to wait too long before the girls rejoined them. This time, everyone promised to behave in the raft, so the ride down the river was fairly uneventful. They reached their destination and set up camp in a little clearing near the trees. Everyone hung up their clothes on branches in the late afternoon sun in the hopes of letting them dry out a little before the next day's journey. After a quick supper, the cards were brought out again. Dylan had to admit that he hadn't expected to enjoy the weekend so much. He also liked Kelly's friends more than he thought he would. They seemed determined to embrace and love life no matter what their circumstances. Dylan admired them for that, since it certainly wasn't his strength. He had been wallowing in guilt and gloom for such a long time that this trip was like a breath of fresh air. Dylan would have to thank the group for kidnapping him earlier. That was something he never once thought that he would do. The night began much the same as last night, although a little less tense. Kelly stayed on her side of the tent, but sometime during the night she crept back over and snuggled up to him. Dylan found that he didn't mind, so he went back to sleep. The light of dawn was coming through the tent again, and Dylan tried to do his best to stay dozing in the warm comfort of the tent. Kelly woke up and stretched. She paused immediately as she came into contact with the warm body. Wait, she had been in contact with the warm body the entire time she was sleeping. Now she was pressed quite firmly against it. Embarrassed, she slowly tried to extricate herself from Dylan. Please don't. A sleepy rumble filled her ear. His morning stubble was against her cheek. I was just thinking how nice it was to wake up with another person after so many years of being alone. Kelly stilled. She knew Dylan was sad, but she'd never really thought of him as lonely since he had two boys. How long has it been? Since Wren died? Almost nine years. Dylan's voice was quiet. Wren was such a beautiful name, Kelly thought. She furrowed her brow. Avery's only eight. She was pregnant when she passed, he explained. The doctors kept her on life support until Avery was viable. That must have been very hard. Kelly couldn't imagine it. She could hear his heart strong and steady under her ear. How long has it been since your husband passed, he asked. Kelly traced a line on Dylan's shirt. Almost nine years? I had just found out I was pregnant. Christopher was ill, and we both knew our time together was going to be brief. I'm sorry, Dylan said. I'm not. Kelly smiled at the memory. It was hard. I won't deny that. However, we both wanted to squeeze out every bit of joy out of Christopher's remaining time, and I think we did. Dylan found himself envying Christopher a little bit. What would it be like trying to squeeze joy out of life? What about you? Was yours a happy marriage? Kelly asked. No, Dylan said honestly and without thinking. He mentally kicked himself. He wasn't in the habit of disparaging Wren's memory. 
We had our moments of joy, but overall it was... Kelly waited while he searched for a word. Difficult, he finally said. Dylan swallowed hard at the memories that crowded in. He felt the need to explain, which wasn't what he usually did in regards to his wife. Wren struggled with depression. Sometimes she could be brilliant and beautiful. Sometimes the medications had her in a fog. Sometimes. Sometimes the monster inside her, the depression, won. Kelly instinctively hugged him. For a moment he tensed, but allowed her to embrace him. She wondered if he had truly grieved over his wife. Kelly could understand Dylan was probably just as busy as she was trying to parent his two boys. Being a solo mom or dad didn't always leave a lot of time for taking care of oneself. After a moment he relaxed. Dylan lifted his head to look at her. He had such nice gray eyes, she mused. He smoothed her hair away from her face, and Kelly wondered if he was going to kiss her. Her stomach clenched in anticipation. Then the tent shook. Get up, lazy bones. Time to get it together. Dylan had an involuntary smile and leaned his forehead against hers. Your friends are interesting. That's one way of putting it, Kelly groused. Still, I suppose I'll keep them. Dylan gently withdrew from the sleeping bag and grabbed his borrowed hiking shoes. Kelly watched him for a moment before getting up. He was taking everything really well, considering he might have had other plans for the weekend. Kelly liked him even more for being kind to her friends, even if they didn't deserve it, after kidnapping him. Kelly wondered what he thought of her. They all had dry clothes, but their boots were still damp from the dunking everyone except Bax had taken yesterday. We can't wear these shoes like this, Dylan stated. We'll all get blisters. There's a solution for that, Bex smiled and threw a couple of plastic baggies at him. She handed them out around the camp. Bread bags, just like the good old days. Excuse me? Dylan asked in confusion, holding onto two bags advertising the merits of enriched vitamins. Rich boy doesn't know. Bo shook his head sorrowfully. He probably never had cold, wet feet as a kid. Bread bags are the poor person's solution to wet winter feet, Kelly explained. We wore our shoes or old boots to school in the winter. Just because something had a hole in it didn't mean it got replaced, so to make sure feet stayed dry, you wrap the bread bags around your socks before inserting your foot into your shoe. Seriously? Dylan wondered if they were trying to pull one over on him. Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without, Derek quoted. Where is that from? asked Dylan. It was actually a slogan from the War Advertising Council during World War II, but it's pretty much standard amongst those who have to do with less. Derek shrugged. Can't afford new shoes? Suck it up and put baggies in so your feet stay dry. That's crazy, Dylan remarked. That is how the other half live, brother, Tomlin said, stuffing his bagged feet into his hiking boots and tying up the laces. Dylan had been to some poor countries during his travels. He had met people who hadn't even owned shoes. However, it never occurred to him that people might be so poor in America that they couldn't afford shoes that didn't leak, or boots for winter, especially for their children. They broke camp and began the long walk up the trail. Every year they walked the same trail like a tradition. Kelly breathed in the fresh air and wished she could do this with Bentley. If she had more time and the money, she'd love to go camping more often. She would like to do a lot of things more often. Unfortunately, Kelly had been working 60 hours a week to just almost pay the bills, which meant that she didn't have time. Now she needed a job more than ever, and she worried that she was going to end up working 80 or more hours a week. Kelly would never see her son. Her stomach cramped up at the thought. Then there was the fact that in 10 short years, Bentley would be looking at colleges. Kelly couldn't even afford to pay for the basics on her own. How was she supposed to save for her son's education? Resolutely, Kelly shoved the thoughts out of her head. This weekend was not about worries. It was about enjoying the company of her friends in the great outdoors. They had one last night on this trip, and then they would pack up and go home. Kelly would deal with all her woes then. She breathed in the air determinedly. It was so nice to be out of the city. They couldn't even hear a single car out here. Kelly had lived in the city all her life, since she simply didn't have the financial option to move. 
She wondered what it would be like to be able to choose. Hey, birds! Bex pointed to a group of ducks on a pond. Do we have any leftover bread to feed them? Honey, we are feeding an extra mouth. Tomlin wrapped an arm around her. There is no extra. Oh, she sighed. That's okay. I can feed ducks at the city park later. Here. Tomlin took a pack of crackers out of the pocket of his pants. It's not much, but maybe you can feed a duck. Or the fish, if they get it first. Bex beamed up at him. Bo rolled his eyes and kept on hiking, while Bex tossed bits of crackers as far as she could get into the water. Dylan and Kelly continued after Bo. Is this normal for Bex? Dylan asked. She seems a little off. She is off, Kelly laughed. She is also a mastermind when she wants to be, so don't be fooled by the helpless damsel in distress attitude. Dylan had to ruefully admit that Kelly might be right. He had forgotten Bex's part in his kidnapping too fast. Any special events today? We go through Fat Man's Cave. I hope you aren't claustrophobic, Kelly asked. No, he assured her. Good, she grinned. Then we camp on a nice little sandy beach. Tomorrow it will only be an hour or so hike before we make it back to the cars. Then it's back to the normal world, Dylan remarked. Yep, Kelly forced a smile. I am avoiding that for the next day at least. Ever thought of doing anything in insurance? he asked. No, Kelly laughed. I'm good at nursing and menial jobs. I have no experience with insurance. Just a suggestion, Dylan shrugged. Maybe you would make a good astronaut. Astronaut? Like going into space. She laughed some more. Are you crazy? Soon the group were tossing out all sorts of inappropriate and unlikely new careers for Kelly to try, from professional wrestler to a robot builder. Underwater candle lighter was voted the best, and Kelly promised to sign up for a course as soon as she could find one in the field. They came upon Fat Man's Cave, which was a bit of a misnomer as the cave was a really skinny chasm in the rock face. Each walked single file through the chasm, sometimes even having to turn sideways to get through, dragging their packs along. Dylan wasn't claustrophobic, however he was glad when they got to the other side. The walls had been uncomfortably close for a while. A couple of hours later and they made camp at the little beach. The cards were broken out after threats to go swimming in the water were quelled. Kelly cited parasites, typhoid, polio, all as reasons not to. They all confirmed they were vaccinated for polio, but Tiana won out when she said she wasn't sharing a tent nor a car with swampy-smelling people. When bedtime came, they all crawled into their tents. Kelly huffed and said that since she was just going to end up hogging the tent after she fell asleep, she might as well get comfortable beforehand. Dylan just smiled and let her snuggle in close enough to touch, but not exactly cozied up to him. They both knew it would change in a matter of time. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Reluctant Husband. Also, please share this video for others to find it. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.